have a slow one No, I don't take shit I got no love for the fakeness If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this I'll always show up I don't have a slow one No, I don't take shit I got no love for the fakeness If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this I'll always show up and make a Section 1 Jack is on his way to Margaret's house party. He is phoning her for directions. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have another chance to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Jack has got lost on his way to Margaret's party. He is phoning her for directions. Hello, is that Margaret? Yes, who's speaking? Margaret, it's Jack. I think I'm lost. I can't see a signpost and... Jack, so where are you now? Well, I'm a bit confused about the directions, but I'm at a T-junction. What can you see around you? I can see a pub on the corner. Can you see the name of the pub? Wait a minute, let me see. It's hard to see in the dark. Yes, I can read it now. It's called the Lion's mm, Head. Oh, the Lion's Head. OK, well then you're not too far away. Go straight ahead through the traffic lights to the next T-junction. Sorry, I didn't hear you. What did you say? I said just go through to the next T-junction. OK. Now what? Well, there's a park in front of you and a large two-storey building on the corner. Ah, uh, yes, I can see them. OK. So now turn left. Hang on. You're coming up the street, so you'll have to turn right. OK, got it. What's the name of your street? It's Wesley Street. W-E-S-L-E-Y, number 70. We're the fifth house on the left. You should see a red letterbox and some bushes in front of the house. OK. Fifth house, number 70. I should be there soon. Am I late for the party? It sounds like things are happening there. No, it's only just started. That's good. I should be there in the next ten minutes. See you soon. Jack hangs up and walks on. Seven minutes later, he calls Margaret again, as he still can't find the house. You now have some time to look at questions six to ten. As you listen, answer questions 6 to 10. Who's speaking? Hi, Margaret. It's Jack again. Sorry to bother you. Listen, would you mind doing me a favour? Of course. What? Could you tell Mike I have got his camera? I've tried to send him a text message, but it's not going through. Oh, he's not here yet. Oh, dear. He said he'd be there early. He might be lost too. OK, I'll call him. What's his number? 0482 563379. Oh, so that's 0485? No, no, 0482 OK, I'll call him right away. But where are you now? Well, I'm in your street, but I still can't find your house. I can't see the numbers very clearly, or a red letter box. It's pretty dark. I thought you said it was easy to find. Oh, OK, wait there. I'll come outside and get you. All right then, 
And don't worry about calling Mike. I'll try to call him now. Hang on, there's someone coming down the street. It looks like Mike. Oh, and I can see the letterbox now. It was hidden behind a bush. See you soon. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a recorded message giving information about an animal park. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the first part of the message and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to the Australian Wildlife Park Information Line. The Australian Wildlife Park is very proudly owned and operated by an Australian family, John and Amanda Brooks, who operate the Australian Wildlife Park with their children, David and Sandra. The family doesn't receive any government assistance. It's solely funded by tourists visiting the park. Thank you for your support and assistance. When the Brooks family purchased the Australian Wildlife Park in 1987, the park housed a small collection of animals and birds on a modest five acre or two hectare property. A few years later, the park doubled in size when the family purchased the adjoining property. Also, the collection of animals started to boom. In May 2003, the family designed and built a new park in the public open space. Once again, more than doubling in size. The park now features about 200 species with more than 2,000 head of animals, birds and reptiles. Regarding the entry fee, adults pay $23, children aged 3 to 14 pay $10, age pensioners are $17 and students are $16. One of the great things about the Australian Wildlife Park is that all of the attractions are included in the entry fee. No extra money is needed around the park, so make the most of your experience. All shows, talks, photo opportunities and animal food are included in your entry fee. In addition, the Australian Wildlife Park is open every day of the year from 9am to 5.30pm, except Christmas Day, 25th of December. Before the final part of the message, you now have 20 seconds to look at questions 16 to 20. Now answer questions 16 to 20. Several attractions are available to visitors to the Australian Wildlife Park. Firstly, you can meet the koalas between 10 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. Here, people can view the koala colony in a natural environment. Another attraction is to feed the kangaroos between 9 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Visitors can take a walk through the kangaroo enclosure, viewing them in a natural environment. Kangaroo food is provided and the kangaroos are very friendly. Also enjoyable are the wombats. At 11am, 2pm and 3.45pm, there are interactive shows where the team is delighted to introduce you to these popular animals. Other attractions that may interest you are an interactive farmyard. 
suitable for children of all ages. Animal food is provided and the animals are very friendly. In addition, the working farm is where the country comes to town. Visitors can milk a cow, bottle feed a lamb, watch farm dogs gathering the sheep. All the excitement of a real Australian farm. When they ask for volunteers, be sure to put your hand up. Everyone can get involved. We at the Australian Wildlife Park hope all our visitors have an enjoyable time. See you soon. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear two students called Katie and Harry discussing a project they are both working on. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, Harry. Katie, hi. Look, let's sit down and work out what we've got to do for this next project we've got for the geography course. I'm glad we're doing it together. We should be able to split it between us so it's not too much work. <laughs> yes, Harry. I had quite a long chat about it with Dr Smith yesterday, so I've got quite a good idea of how we should be organising it. Now, he said we've got to move on from the general project we did on soil erosion and look specifically at coastal change. I think that'll be interesting, don't you? Yeah. I was thinking about it last night because we'll have to make sure we pick our days to visit the beaches. It seems as a reasonable train service to White Sands Bay, but the weather could stop us from getting all the samples we need. It could take us longer than we think. Mm, yeah, but we could save ourselves some time if we try to get hold of any information that's already been collected. I know several postgraduates who have done stuff in White Sands Bay this year, though on other topics. We could check out what the Marine Biology Unit have got. They're bound to have something we could use. OK. Let's do that this week and arrange to go to the beach next week. I think we'll need about three days. If we book ahead, we can probably stay in the University Lodge when we're down there. The other thing is we must go to the Environment Agency and get permission to take the samples, just in case anyone challenges us when we're down there. I think we'll have to fill out a form or something. Right, Harry. Now, let's work out who's going to do what first, because we have to get it done by the end of this month. I think we ought to divide up the data collection between us. What? So only one of us goes to the beach, do you mean? No. I think we both ought to get a picture of what's involved, but there's no need for us both to do everything. I mean, when we're at the beach, you could go to both ends and make sure we have the set of shots we need to illustrate where erosion has taken place. OK, fine. And I'll move up the beach and pick up the different stones and put sand in bags. Does that seem fair to you? Yeah, OK. Then what about the other stuff? Do you want me to go and do the questionnaires while you're on the beach? We'll get more people that way. Or is it better if we do them together? Mm, I think that would be better. We could set aside a whole day for it. What about the lab work, looking at what we've collected and testing it? Mm, I don't mind doing it, but I'm pretty slow. OK, you can leave that to me. Fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, 
You have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Then that leaves us two weeks to write it up ready for the presentation to the class on the 29th. Shall we do the presentation together? Like you do the first bit, me the second. Actually, no, I think that can be a bit muddling for the class. I'd like to do the presentation, if you don't mind. Fine by me. It's just that it won't affect the marks that you get. I mean, it's not like I get more for actually doing it. The tutor will judge it as a whole. But I think I remember them saying at the beginning of the year that we were expected to do three before the end of the year in order to get a satisfactory mark. And I'm one behind, whereas you've already done yours, haven't you? I can see why they put them into the course, because most interviews for jobs demand you do a presentation nowadays. Yeah. Does that mean I have to write it up? I think it'll be impossible to do that together. Yes, you're very good at that. <laughs> oh, yes. Typical that I get landed with it as usual. Actually, I don't mind. I know we haven't got very long, but that's OK. Often I write better when I'm pushed for time. It focuses the mind. But I'll have to have a think about how we present the data, because that won't be straightforward like the rest. So I'd like a bit of help with that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> anyway, I was thinking, after we've done the presentation, I think it'd be a good idea if we asked our classmates to tell us what they think of our conclusions. Well, I don't know. They won't have done the research, so... Whatever they say would be uninformed. Oh, I don't agree. I mean, they've all worked on something similar, so they know what's involved, and it would be useful to see how they think ours stands up. We'll have to be sure of our ground, make sure we don't make any mistakes in our results or whatever. I don't mean I think they're going to tell us anything new, just give us their thoughts on the process. OK. Then I'll deal with the questions at the end. Dr Smith said we would have to prepare thoroughly for this and I'll probably get lots of background stuff in the process of writing up so I'll be prepared for any surprises. <laughs> if he's impressed by your presentation, then we should do well. Right. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk by a university lecturer in Australia on a type of bird called a peregrine falcon. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I'm Professor Sam Richards and I've come as the third guest lecturer on this course in Australian Birds of Prey. My job is to keep a watchful scientific eye on the state of Tasmanian peregrines. So I'll start by giving you some background to these magnificent birds of prey before I speak briefly on my own project. 
Peregrine falcons are found on all continents with the exception of Antarctica, so don't go looking for them at the South Pole. They're found almost everywhere in Australia, and it's interesting to note that the name peregrine implies that they're wanderers, that they move from place to place following the seasons, and indeed in most parts of the world they're migratory birds. But not in Australia, however, where they prefer to stay in one place. They're known to be the world's fastest creature, and they have been tracked by radar diving down towards the ground at 180 kilometres an hour. However, a number of textbooks claim that their flight speed can go as high as 350 kilometres an hour, so there's still some dispute about just how fast they can actually fly. Female peregrine falcons, like all other Australian falcons, are larger than their male counterparts. In fact, the female is almost a third larger than the male in the case of peregrines. While she stays close to the nest to protect the eggs and the young chicks, the male is mostly occupied looking for food. Peregrines typically lay two or three eggs per nest, and after the eggs have hatched, when the chicks are about 20 days old, they start to fly. So they fly at a very young age. By the time they're just 28 days old, they've already reached full adult size. In other words, they're fully grown. Soon after this, at about two months after hatching from the egg, they leave the nest for good. From this point on, they're on their own. Unlike their parents, which have learned how to hunt, the young falcons are not good at feeding themselves, and so during the first year, about 60% of them die. Once the birds have managed to live to breeding age, at two years old, they generally go on to live for another six or seven years. When we come across nests with young chicks, the first thing we do is catch the chicks before they're able to fly. We have to catch them at an early age. We then attach identification rings to their legs. These rings are made of colour-coded aluminium, and they allow us to identify the birds through binoculars later in their lives. Thirdly, because we need to know how many males and how many female chicks are being born, we note the sex of the chicks. Noting the sex of the birds is a vital part of our research, as I will discuss later. The next thing to do is to take a blood sample from the chicks. We take the blood sample so that we can check the level of pesticide in their bodies. Peregrine falcons can build dangerous quantities of pesticides in their bloodstream by feeding on smaller mammals, which in turn feed on crops grown on farms where pesticides are used. Finally, we check the birds thoroughly, really checking the birds for their general health. This whole process only takes a few minutes. In fact, most of our time in the field is actually spent trying to find the nests, not on the data collection itself. Well, that's all I have for you today. If you'd like to do some further reading. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. I don't ever slow up, no, I don't take shit. I got no love for the fakeness. If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this, I'll show up. I don't ever slow up, no, I don't take shit. I got no love for the fakeness. If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this, So instinctive and so passionate Every word I move so descriptive like an adjective I got a vendetta against people who patented Being negative when you should be getting after it I got facts over facts over tracks This and that spitting slow, spitting fast I could roast, I could gas, think I'm okay at last But I don't know if that can erase all the past And the pettiness, a reflection of the emptiness Hilarious, you think you're worth my time You're delirious, mysterious Because you are behind a fake exterior Inferior, you know I'll always be a bit superior Get off of me, this ain't no humble brag I want you to hear words, you can say them back I want you to feel free from the chains at last And to believe in what you got, it was built to last, yeah now that I've been put through hell I never got anyone's help I had to do it all myself